for the next thing you need to do so when you have in, you have done your research and you have chosen your country you have chosen your province or your state you have chosen the program that you are going to study and you have chosen the school the next thing you need to do is to gather your application documents so how do you even gather your application documents so you need to go into that school into the website of that school to check what are the application requirements what do these people require of me for me to do this application so you have to check and part of the requirements for your application is documents so you need to start gathering your application documents because without the application documents you cannot submit your application right so you need to start gathering your application documents so there are documents that are easy to get that you don't have to struggle with for example transcripts even though especially if you are from nigeria it's not easy to get your transcript from your school but if you have your transcript you don't need to do anything you just need to upload it so that one is quite easy as regards the application it may not be easy to obtain it but when you have it you don't need to do any other thing on that transcript but things like let's start from sop sop stands for statement of purpose it's, a, it's, it's like an essay, a short essay that you write that tells, that informs the admissions committee about you, who you are, what's your unique story, why are you doing this course, why now, what will this program do for you? These are the kind of questions that your SOP answers. And your SOP should be unique. You see those people that go and copy SOP from, um, from Google, you go and research and say SOP for accounting, for masters in accounting, you go and copy it. Let me tell you, there's something that they call Turn It In. It's an app that they use to check for pl plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you have gone to do copy and paste. It's an app that they use to check it. When they put your document in Turn It In, if you have over 15% plagiarism, they are going to throw your application in the garbage. So your application, was, you, I know you may be thinking, but you are not unique. Everybody has a unique story. Everybody has a reason why they are going to do what. Even if you don't have it right now, you can think of something. When you have decided, you can think about it. Ask yourself questions and answer those questions. Then you find your answers to your unique story in there. So you have to write your SOP. It should be unique to you. Don't go and copy and paste. That's the easiest way for your application to be thrown away. Then you prepare that document. I find that most people struggle with SOP. Yeah, you are not alone, no. Because now it's easy for me to be saying this, but when I was doing my own application that time, it wasn't easy. So you are not alone in this struggle to write your SOP. My very first SOP I wrote, when I sent it to somebody to review, the person told me that this thing looks like a Facebook post. It took me days to write that SOP. But he told me, ah, this thing looks like a Facebook post. It will not fly. I was so disappointed because I put in a lot of work, a lot of effort to write that SOP. So you need to write that SOP and it has to be unique, free of grammatical errors. You need to follow, a, have a structural flow, follow a structural pattern. Remember that the person that is reading it is learning about you. So it has to, you need to write it to make sense. You cannot just write anything for the sake of it. You can't. Then cv so they have two types of cv there is the academic cv and there is the um professional cv so when you are putting together your cv for study you are putting together an academic cv not a professional cv many of us right now we would have professional cvs because maybe we use the cvs to apply for jobs or we are in the process of applying for jobs what you need when you're going to school is an academic cv the way the cv is arranged is different the like the things that you need to put in the cv the subheadings is different and you need to make sure that you are preparing the cv that is important to what you are applying for so now your course so you should be focusing on your educational experience, your work experience that is relevant to what you're doing, including your volunteer experience that is relevant to what you're doing. And then you should put together your CV, your academic CV. Remember, like I said, many of us have professional CVs, but you are using academic CV for your application. Keep that in mind. And one thing I find with a lot of people's CVs, 
I've reviewed a lot of CV, so I see this all the time. A lot of people's CV just reflect their job role. They don't talk about their achievements. When you are putting together your CV, whether now whether you are applying for, you are using professional CV or you are putting together professional CV or academic CV, learn this from me with CVs. Your CV should talk about your achievement. So if you are claiming that you were a manager and you managed, um, managed a project from beginning to end to the end. How many people were on the project that you managed? How many team members did you manage? You should put put you need to put numbers. Put num you know, when you're writing your CV, put numbers. How many people on that team did you manage? What was the impact of the project that you did? Did you save time? How long did you save? Did you save money? How much did you save money compared to what would have been spent? So whatever it is, you need to start putting, put, put, put numbers. Make things make sense when you are doing these things. So that's another thing you need to look out for in your CV. When it comes to academic applications, grad school, volunteering is very important. So you need to have some sort of volunteer experience. Add it there reference letters this one people don't take seriously but it ranks in some schools it ranks like number one when it comes to how they grade your application one of the reasons why i have been able to secure over 350k scholarships it's not because of anything else it's because my reference letters are solid how do i know you may be thinking i do write reference letters for my professors i was i was lucky one day that one scholarship application i did I think they wanted me to do something. So somehow they returned the application back to me for me to update something. And my referees had already sent the reference letter. So when they returned the application back to me, they forgot to remove the reference letters from it. So that's how I saw the reference letters. That's how I know that my reference letters are solid. So reference letters, people underestimate reference letters. People don't take it seriously. First of all, you should know who you are choosing to be your referee. Not anybody can be your referee. Not your family member, not your friend can be your referee. Your referee has to be somebody who has worked with you in a certain capacity. So now they will ask you for either academic or professional references. So if you are, if you are submitting an academic reference, it should be somebody who has either taught you like a lecturer or worked with you in one in one form or the other is it a project supervisor did you do a term paper with the person whatever it is and again reference letters should not be generic it should talk about you give examples of what you have done and why this person claims that you are good so some people just say like eh, zeno okay zeno is intelligent she's reliable she's dependable she thinks on her feet she's no you need to you need to tell the people how how do you come to the conclusion that Zeno is intelligent? How do you know that Zeno is a self starter? Give examples. When I've known Zeno for three years, and when we worked on this project, Zeno did not need any guidance, and she went together and did the design of experiment and began the project. So this then you can now claim that Zeno is a self is a self starter. She can work on her own. She can think on her feet because you have given examples with these things. So don't just go and write anything. So first of all, as we talked about who should be your referee. So if we're talking about professional ref referees, for example, your boss at work, your colleague at work, or even if you are a business owner, or even if you are a business owner, maybe your customers that have worked with you or people that you have done businesses with because not everybody has like an official job they are some people are self-employed so who are these people that you have worked with what can they say about you so this, this these are things that you should look out for so if you are fortunate enough that your referee says okay you know you know what i'm so busy i don't have time write the reference letter and give it to me i'll sign it and upload it then it's important that you the applicant should know how to write a solid reference letter 
it's very easy for people to talk about themselves, right? I'm sure if I call you now and say, come, tell me about yourself. You, it's easy. People are able to talk about themselves. But people are not able to talk about their achievements. Some people is as a result of humility. They are so humble that they downplay their achievements. No. In, in things like this, you cannot downplay your achievement. You need to hype it. Even if it's small, you make it look mighty. Make it look big. Hype it. So, then you can write your reference letter. Send it to this person and they will submit it. There's one of my employees who's currently applying for grad school now. In fact, the last reference letter that the guy wrote and sent to me, I was like, wow. <laughs> we need to put this reference letter in the museum. <laughs> it was so good. Like, I'm like, if I'm the one that is, that is in charge of this admission and this scholarship, I will just tell you, take all my money, take all my money. It was really good. And I told him to write it and send it, send it to me. So write it. Let me see what you want to see in this reference letter. Write it and send it to me. So some people will tell you to send your reference letter. Some people want to write it. So let's assume that this professor now or this lecturer, your academic referee, tells you that they want to write your reference letter. How do you support them so that you know that they are giving, they are writing the right information or something that makes sense for you you can send them up an updated cv send them the things that you have let your cv reflect the things that you have achieved recently because since when you finish from school up to until this moment you've achieved a lot of things let your cv reflect these things that you have achieved send them your transcript if necessary send them like some bullet points of things that you have achieved or things that should, you think should go in the reference just to help them because some of them may just go and write this generic thing for you and you don't want any any generic thing because it, if they do that do you know who it impacts it impacts you you lose your ability to compete with the sea of other applicants so you need to take these things seriously okay so let's move so for people that are applying for um, like research position. So let's say research masters PhD. They may ask you for something like writing sample. I hear this a lot. You know, what is writing sample? Writing sample is a sample of anything that you have written. So if you're applying for to grad school, it should be something academic related. So for some people, they have blog posts. The blog post is talking about an issue or something. You can send that. For some people, they have published research papers. Not everybody applying for master's. Are in fact, it's very few people. Before I applied for my master's, I didn't have any publications. When people have published research papers, some of you, you have your thesis. You can send a portion of your thesis. So these are examples of writing samples that you can send. Otherwise, you can look for something on the internet, like a paper, and summarize. If you don't have any of these things, you can prepare your own writing sample by summarizing an, a very interesting topic, but is related to what you are doing. Summarize it. Make sure that you have referenced whatever sources that you have used, and then you can use that. So that's writing sample. Research proposal is another one. So if you are doing research positions, mostly it's PhDs that they ask for research proposal. When I applied for my own PhD, I didn't have to put any research proposal. It wasn't a requirement. But there are some schools that require you to write a research proposal. So normally they'll tell you that, okay, research proposal of one or two pages. It's proposing your future research, what you are going to do. So something that you are proposing, you just need to add something that is novel, right? And it does not mean that you are going to do that research because many times, in fact, not many times, it's your supervisor's research that is going to inform the research that you are going to do at the end of the day. So, you need to just write something that you are interested in and as long as it's related to the research areas in the school that you are applying to, then it makes sense. Then, for those schools that require some sort of exams, like IELTS, GRE, and all that. So you have to get your um, results ready to upload. So now, I think I skipped something. Before we even started talking about gathering of application documents and choosing of schools, you need to find out, like, when you've, when you've chosen the school, before you start gathering application documents, you need to find out at what point, especially if you're interested in scholarship, what point do you need to apply for these scholarships? Are you supposed to find a supervisor? Are you supposed to secure your funding before you apply for admission? 
do you need to get your admission first before you apply for funding or are you putting the application together and indicating that you need funding and doing the extra work to apply for funding so you need to know this so if you are applying for funding for example in a school where you need to find a supervisor first then you are emailing supervisors you are emailing professors you are looking for supervisors so you have to do that before you apply for admission that's because on your application your admission application is going to ask you that have you secured supervisor there'll be a place for you to say yes or no and if your answer is yes they will ask you for the name of the supervisor so you need to do that first before you begin any form of application so now that you have gathered your documents you have found your supervisor you've gathered your documents then you go online and you submit your application online so this for, for submission of application is the easiest part especially when you have gathered all your documents so what you need to do is to fill your application from online so when you're done filling your application for you to submit your application for most schools you need to pay an application fee application fee will range between i talk in dollars because i'm in canada it could be the currency of wherever you're applying to it could range between like 50 dollars to 250 dollars it depends on the school so you have to pay your application fee i know a lot of people in nigeria struggle to pay application fee just because of all the cbn issues and the limits on bank card right but you have to figure out there's a, there are ways out to figure it out so you pay application fees note that for some schools you are able to get application fee waiver for some it's obvious they tell you on the website if you want to request for waiver they tell you how to go about requesting for waiver for some other schools you may have to write the grad coordinator or the admissions officer to request for waiver so you may be able to request for waiver depending on the school and they give you application fee waiver so that you submit your application without paying any application fee so that's a plus at least it helps you to keep your money in your pocket i would do that if i were you then when you have done that then you cannot take a break break and breathe <laughs> you know why i say you should take a break and breathe because there is a waiting period so once you have submitted your application then you get to that point where you have to wait so now you're waiting for so now it's a waiting period so you have to wait for your admission so it depends on the schools but the school if you check on their website they're going to inform you like give you an idea of how long you have to wait for you to get before you hear back from them so it could be anywhere between from weeks from even days not even weeks it could be anywhere from days to months so it depends on the school but if you have done your application by yourself you should be confident that you get a response so everybody gets a response whether your application is successful or unsuccessful everybody gets a response because i hear some people tell me that you know their agent did this application for them and they'll be waiting and waiting and waiting so they don't even know if the agent actually submitted it or they did not submit it so that's why i said if you have done your application by yourself and you have submitted it by yourself when you are waiting you know that you are still waiting for something so you know that we only expect good things so you are successful and you get the admission and you get the scholarship Woohoo! congratulations <laughs> what do you do next you apply for visa again we hope for good things right you're, su you're successful and you get your visa you're excited yeah drum roll <laughs> and then you relocate so these are the steps